and it's a very big pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for asking us to participate in this extraordinary event, really. Can you hear if I hold the microphone on this stage? Not so much? Better like this? Okay. Okay, then. Um, when we um, were asked to do this talk, uh, the, the theme obviously was boundaries, and we started to think about what does it mean to design sustainably in within boundaries. And the first things we did is to re-question ourselves, what does sustainability really mean? And you probably know this, but it comes from Latin. It's a word, it's a verb, sustinere, which means to support, to hold. But in the way that uh, we've been using, I think, across the world in most recent years, it comes, the first time was used by the United Nations uh, in the 1980s. And it comes from one of the reports, and it says that sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Which in itself, of course, it's a fantastic sort of a, um, a desire to do. And it, in many ways, it means supporting one generation, support the next one that goes up. With a planet that supports mankind to do that. And under the banner of this uh, um, sort of talk today, we thought we might challenge slightly this concept, this idea that you always put man at the center of design and man at the center of the focus. This is something that as architects, students, urban designers, you've been taught to do from the very beginning. Mankind has been doing it for a long time. All the space we generate, the measure design for the man to inhabit it which in some respect, of course, is fundamental. It is it allowed spaces to be used by the people that inhabit them as best as they can. But ultimately, in the year 2023, is it right that we design just with that in focus? I mean, if you look at a bigger picture, if you zoom out, uh, mankind is a very small part of this picture. We are just down here. Um, let's see. Uh, no. Here we go. So we are just a very small proportion of this. The largest part of that is plants, of course. Without them, we couldn't survive on this planet. They absorb the majority of the carbon is here. They form about half of the, of the, the, the biomass on the planet. The rest is anthropods and, and then fish. And we are just 0.01% of all of that. So if you look at it that way, then you start to think, well, perhaps I should design in a different way. Maybe there are other things I should take into account for a society that tried to live on the planet. And of course, this relationship between man and nature in the last 150 years has been quite complicated. Um, man has looked at nature as something to observe, to meditate, to ponder upon, it's sublime. But all is the man on the top of the mountain, nature in front of you as a spectacle. We also have done and keep doing using the planet and, and its resources as our resources without often understanding the huge impact that this has on not just the location where we're doing that, but much bigger ecosystem we're now starting to understand, which are miles away and have huge repercussions for a much broader context than the one we're directly affecting. And of course, this is a picture of the North Circular, which is a road that bounds around London, but you probably have pictures of spaces like this here, and there are pictures of spaces sadly like this in all the Western world, where man has designed spaces without nature. We somewhat have managed to, to, to obliterate it and take it out. And as you probably are aware, the planet is ringing quite a bell saying that's not possible, we can't do this anymore. There are floods everywhere. Um, in, enormous sort of places have got no, no rain at all, which in, in counterparts creates no food supply. So we're not just shaking the natural environment, we're then shaking our own environment. And in any return to that, this huge conflict hitting everywhere, which suggests that we are really reach a, a, a collapse point. If we go beyond, we can't come back. And so we probably need to change this. And it seems to be sort of an understanding that um, all of these issues that are listed on this slide are probably things that in themselves individuals have been trying to tackle. But it's just if we can get a picture where we can put them all in balance and start to look at all of them as one sort of uh, ecosystem, then I think probably stand a chance to turn the corner. 
And so if we talk about boundaries, uh, where is the boundary? In physical term, I think the boundary we thought per perhaps is the planet. I mean, that's where we live, that's sort of the, the physical bound of where, where we stand on. And at the moment, you probably know this, the planet in the round is consuming about 1.75 times the energy and resources that currently are on one single planet. So already we are almost twice consuming, exceeding that boundary, if you wish, that you're meant to be doing. But this is also a very uneven story. So for countries that are at the bottom here, at least is one is India, they consume almost a planet, 0.8 of the planet. There are others like the USA, they consume five and a half planets. The Netherlands, which is the, just because we are here today, we thought to highlight it, consume three and a half is the picture to the right. And the UK is about two and a half. A lot of that is to do with the density of the population. Things that are about more than 400 inhabitants per square square meter in this country. It's about 260 per square meter in the UK. So you can see that you have a large population biting a very small chunk of, of, of land. And people have tried to define the environmental boundaries in all sorts of ways. This is the Stockholm Resilience Center, which defined the planetary boundaries through nine sort of categories which are sort of the physical element of, of the planet, but from the biosystems to sort of the stratosphere around it. And if you are into the center heart, green heart of it, it means we're doing okay. But if we sp spill all the way to the orange boundary, then I think we've exceeded. And data says that humankind have done more damage to the planet in the last 50 years than they've ever done since the man was here first time on the earth. So we're moving too fast, too fast rate. If we continue like that, there is no planet and there is no life in return. And we thought this was quite an interesting concept, biocapacity. So on one side, there is a footprint. So is the impact we're all doing on the planet. So we're consuming one and a half Earths um, as a sort of human race. But on the other side, there's the ability of the land which we have to regenerate itself. How much waste can the land absorb? How much product can that, that land produce and that using sort of the natural element? And that defines the biocapacity of a country. And again, this is quite an uneven balance. It, it's not a surprise that the creditors of these games are the place with more densely sort of, uh, with more dense vegetation. So the center of South America, the center of Africa here are in deep green, but Europe is in the deep red, the United States in, as a whole, or in fact, the most of Central Asia is in the, in the deep red. So again, this creates a very unbalanced issue, which then creates huge tension uh, between the humans that live in those places. And again, if we just focus on the Netherlands, just to, so to, 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 to relate this back to where we are, uh, the top line that you see there is the, um, the, the, the footprint, so how much does the Netherlands consume? And the bottom line is its biocapacity. And if you're looking at another type of graph, you see that the biocapacity, it, whoops, sorry. The biocapacity is the small sort of uh, graph on the side. That's the footprint that says in foot terms, probably mostly, you can see that this line is more or less that line. You're consuming twice as much as the land available. But the majority of that footprint is generated by carbon. And that carbon is generated mostly by the lifestyle of the people have. What do you, where does the food come from? Where do you go on holiday? How do you get to your, to your work? Do you, do you live somewhere where you have to take the car every day? All of those lifestyle choices, how many clothes do you buy? Where do they come from? That's what really makes a difference. The building are a proportion of this. They do make a difference. It's not just the building of the building make a difference, and journey and we'll touch in a moment, but it's obviously also where does this material that we're using come from? What is going to happen to this material when we demolish the building? All of those choices that we make as part of our life, as citizens of a place, more than as architects, uh, that is what really creates this picture. And what this shows is that if everybody 
was to live as someone living currently. It's gone off. Yeah, off again. Someone was to live in the United States, then on the 13th of March, we would have run out of the resources of the planet. If someone was to live with the lifestyle of someone living in the Netherlands, the 12th of April was the date. Today is the 30th of May, someone living in Hungary, we had that lifestyle, then that's the point where the planets run out of resources, and so on. So that's just like a biological clock that shows you in quite sort of a stark term the impact of what we're doing. So what do we do about it? I personally think we need to change perspective. We need to look at things in a different way. There's a fantastic phrase at the bottom there by James Lovelock, which uh, in the 1970s wrote a book called uh, The Gaia Hypothesis, where he says, Earth is more than just the home where we live on. It's part of our living system and we're part of it. And if we can think it that way, if we can think that we're part of a system rather than just support or be supported by a system, then I think we have a chance to turn it around. And some other people have come up with this idea, which again is a concept of boundaries in many ways, which is the donut economies, which says on one side, there is an override of the natural resources. On the other side, all the social demands, which is the inner of the circle, somewhere there, there's a magic spot, which is that pale green line. That's the safe place to be. That's probably the boundary where we ought to be in. And it's counterbalancing all of those choices that we make from citizen to government to trying to find the spot to be in. And apart, some of that as architects probably is a change of perspective, is an ability of being more tolerant, have a different sense of aesthetic, perhaps let it go a bit, not control every aspect of it, accept that nature comes part of our lives more than it ever does. I think you are the master of this game in this country. There's uh, some fantastic precedents of how this has been done across the cities, spaces, how people has accepted nature to take over sometimes. Uh, Denmark have been doing that the same, and this idea of rewilding our city is coming into place in transforming, in many ways, the building elements into that biocapacity. If we can do that, if we can turn our building into some of the biocapacity of our country, then I think we are on a win. Uh, the New York uh, examples of the High Line shows how rewilding a piece of derelict infrastructure had a huge social impact on that city and actually brought a whole social life back together. Seattle, which is the top right pictures, it shows how introducing growing places into city creates in return stronger community, better integrated places. So it's sort of a win for all. In the UK, there have been some example of rewilding. Uh, the two picture to the right is an experiment that was run last summer at the Tower of London. For the ones of you that might have seen that, that's sort of a bit like a castle with a moat in the middle of a city, and that moat is a fairly sterile environment normally. You can't go in it, and it's alone, so it's got pretty no biodiversity. But actually, last year, they decided to flood it with a wildlife meadow and totally transform the way both human and bio life uh, use that space. And um, this image is here of the Barbican, the top left where a rewilding project has happened and the bottom is Shelfield, where Sheffield University has been at the forefront of this discussion since the 1950s. And so Phil and Kate Bradley, um, what have we done about that? Ian will bring you through that. Uh, we've been trying to tackle this issue for 40 years. So there are, I think the top right is one of our very first projects 40 years ago. In, and, uh, and, and the bottom left is one of our most recent projects. And, in a way of designing places for people and nature together, we have tried to look at this at a different lens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. It's that one. Yeah, the last one.
so the climate climate change is only one planetary boundary that is of uh, fundamental concern, as Sarah has explained. The reduction in energy use and the global warming gases emitted, such as carbon dioxide, alongside the halting of the dramatic reduction in biodiversity and species loss are urgent issues. And in many ways, these have now become the proxy issues we're using to address to try to avert overall environmental disaster. It's our view that designing within constraints, you might say the boundaries, can drive innovation and lead to more appropriate outcomes. The international style that developed in the early 20th century believed that new materials and limitless energy could solve all conditions, irrespective of the conditions of a site, leading to an architecture that defied local cultural and climatic conditions and stepped away from vernacular passive control of environmental performance and use of local materials. I believe that a new vernacular should now develop, taking its clues from solutions developed in response to the climate emergency, taking account of these boundaries that Sarah has described. Dr. Barnabas Calder's recent book on energy and architecture shows how access to energy has had direct impacts on architectural style and ambition. From agricultural societies through the industrial revolution to our current situation, we are now entering a new age which, you will be, which will be, you will be central to, where energy is not limitless, water is scarce, and biodiversity is under threat. And we have to be so much more aware of the resources used in construction and in operating our built environment. So this section of the presentation looks at the work of FCB Studios in this context, describing our vision and the benefits that we believe our approach gives, and describing our aims and the tools we use to support our design including the FCBS Carbon software, which Joe will describe for the workshop. So as Sarah says, the practice has been uh, operating for over 40 years. And looking back at this, the first 27 of those of the period of the practice was really uh, addressing operational energy use. The last 17 have been also looking at materials and embodied carbon and I believe we've just got this seven-year window to 2030 to combine the two and, and uh, resolve climate-positive design. 39% of the carbon emissions are a result of buildings, 11% uh, in embodied carbon and 28% in operation. And we have to have a plan for how we address this to reduce these impacts, to be net zero by 2030 and uh, net uh, biodiversity positive by that date. We need to see what the benefits are, not the problems, environmental, economic, social, and cultural. We have to have aims to reduce the embodied carbon and reduce the operational energy. And I'll describe some of the tools that we have to, to help us on that journey. So in 2019, we set out a route map to, to get to net zero carbon by 2030. And we're now at 2023, having to detail the building so that contractors will uh, build them to those requirements. And then we're going to monitor the projects to make sure that they operate in use so that our portfolio of projects by 2030 will be net zero. And the boundaries have to be looked at in terms of what benefits could be offered in environmental, economic, social, and cultural issues. And I'd like to turn on four items uh, in sequence uh, which we look at in our projects. First of all, retrofit. We need to probably have half our projects as refurbishment projects in order to meet these targets. We have to use the, the buildings that exist. Um, remodeling and reusing them, uh, creatively changing their functions, and giving guidance so that ordinary people can renovate their homes successfully. An example of this is the Shrewsbury Flax Mill Maltings, which was in, in effect the first skyscraper in the world, the first cast iron building uh, built with large windows to give daylight to the flax processes. And this building has been refurbished and structurally enhanced for a series of new uses. At Bath Abbey, near our office in Bath, the, the Abbey floor is now heated 
by connecting up the waste water from the Roman baths, which is uh, thermally hot, uh, to a heat pump, which supplies heating uh, to the floor of the Abbey now. And other spaces have been renovated for new uses. The Middleport Pottery, um, a center of, porcelain, of, of the uh, porcelain industry in the UK, has been renovated as, as much to give community life um, while sustainably giving the building a new use. And two projects that we're uh, just starting on now, a, a new Eden Centre on the left in Dundee in Scotland, where we're repurposing an old gas holder and old industrial site. And on the right, the British Library in the north in Leeds, which is again in a flax mill, this time a horizontal top lit building, um, which is grade one listed. We have to leave a sustainability to make buildings perform for their users and be profitable. The One Brighton scheme, a housing uh, project developed with Bioregional, has been proven to give better value to the flats in resale than other developments in Brighton. Uh, it has a car club, no, no parking, sustainable materials, an energy company that supplies renewable energy to all the units, and gardens on the roof as allotments for people to use. The Dyson Center, a neonatal care, neonatal care unit at Bath General Hospital, provides a welcoming environment. But actually, post-occupancy monitoring has shown that the rates of breastfeeding and, and rest amongst the patients and the staff exceed the existing hospital. Natural light, again, always important in the high project at Worcester Library provided through large skylights in a building which takes its heat from the, the river adjacent and with a parametrically designed roof. And again, where post-occupancy evaluation, the graph at the bottom, is showing that we've been able to reduce energy consumption to align with the design intent, which sadly often isn't the case in new buildings. We have to choose materials with care. At the Woodland Trust headquarters building, they wanted to use wood, but that gave certain problems internally because we wanted also to use passive control of the environment. And we, working with the engineers and the uh, mechanical engineers, developed a solution using concrete ceiling panels bolted to the cross-laminated timber structure, structurally enhancing the performance of the floor and providing a very attractive passive ventilated office space. At Croft Gardens, now called Stephen Taylor Court at King's College in Cambridge, a building which was required to be designed for a 100-year life has used a CLT structure which offsets all the carbon in the other building materials in, in, the, in the site and will provide coming up for 10 years of carbon neutral development in operation. Lastly, in this section, the Old Paradise office building, again, a timber structure where we've looked at different cladding materials and the structure in a highly insulated um, office environment and considered the embodied carbon of different building materials in the elevation and different structural solutions to show that potentially this could have um, a net zero carbon life of coming up for 60 years. We must ensure people, culture, and climate are prioritized. There are two projects abroad here now, one which is an urban uh, re development project in Kigali, in Rwanda, where we're designing a system, a master planning system that allows circulation and land uses to be developed around four themes which the client has set, affordable and socially equitable development, climate change adaptation and mitigation, resource efficiency, and cultural sensitive urban development. Developing typologies using low carbon materials, control of the sun, and housing development that can grow over time as the resources of the community. If you look on the right, the, uh, this is how the development might start, but then the buildings could be developed to further, with further stories and extensions over time. 
biodiversity then is also key to this site. Rwanda is susceptible to heavy rain, and so having growth and shade in, in the hilly site will help uh, save the buildings from damage in the future. And then, strangely, we're doing a master plan for the island of Barbuda, which is next to Antigua. And this is really stepping back and saying, where should you develop? Much of this island is susceptible to ocean um, rise and hurricane winds. And so we're trying to define the areas which are safe to build in, as well as define strategies for how those buildings should be built. So our aims in the short term are to reduce embodied carbon, reduce operational carbon, improve biodiversity. Embodied carbon is the, the energy used in the extraction of materials for building components, their construction, their transport, and, and maintaining the building, which Joe will ex explain in more detail later. And the operational energy is, is all the loads used to keep it in use. So if you look at the second line here, which has products, construction, operational, end of life, and next life, the materials are about 25% of the whole life carbon, if you're looking at a 60-year period of a building. Construction adds another 3%. Uh, operational energy can add um, further. End of life amounts in terms of demolition uh, add also energy. And then if we can reuse the materials, and if we can design to reuse them at the outset, then you can start to get better paybacks. So for products, we need to resource these from renewable sources. We need a fabric-first approach to construction. We need to embrace micro-generation and try and make our projects produce energy. And we need to support the circular economy through finding uses for materials at the end of the building, the first building's life. And just to define net zero carbon, on the left-hand side, uh, negative operational carbon has carbon impacts from building the building, but then over time, you can get some of that back. The central one, negative embodied carbon, is that you might be able to use all biogenic materials and other low carbon materials at the outset, but use energy to heat or cool the building. And the last one, which is really regenerative design, has to have negative operational and embodied carbon which is an ambition, has to be an ambition. So how well are we doing is a question. So on operational energy, we've looked at our, a number of our projects. And in this graph, uh, in, the, in the UK, there's an R, R, RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects target, which is the top of the blue line. And we're setting our own yellow target area. And you can see that over the last five years, most of the projects are not in the area where we need them to be. But we do have four projects which are very low in operational energy. Over time, this is looking at it with over time, where because the grid is decarbonizing, operational energy is actually less carbon intensive. So the target should be lower. And so for, for housing, we've got two schemes which are already uh, well, three schemes which are already below the sort of targets the, the profession is setting for 2030. In higher education buildings, it's a similar picture. And in other office sort of non-domestic buildings, again, we've got some success with low energy buildings in use. Embodied carbon is a similar spread with only a few projects really being innovative. And these are the ones which we've got to spread uh, the knowledge so that we can develop more in the future. Two very good housing projects, two very good university projects, four office buildings, two of which actually are them, um, themselves uh, renovations. So you're already on a winner if you can reuse carbon that's in, the, in a building already. So what are the tools that we use? There's a, num there are, there's a lot of information out there now uh, produced by governments and institutes. Building regulations are slowly improving. In the last two years, Joe and another colleague, Tim, have been trying to set out an embodied carbon building regulation in the UK, which we're calling Part Z, which is starting to have some traction. 
We're involved in other industry-wide initiatives. Um, the Future Homes Hub, an organization called Letty, which produces really good design gardens, which I recommend, and other partnerships. And internally, we use the One Planet Living framework to help communicate the ideas of sustainability under 10 principles, which are in the colored boxes, which we map against the sustainable development goals and set targets for buildings so that at the outset of a project, we can discuss this with the client and the design team and decide how innovative we want to be on each of these different targets. And everything is interrelated, as the network in the center here shows. But this framework is very good. It's a language that just helps us discuss issues with clients, planning authorities, uh, and marketing. Also, One Planet Living does cover all the bases, we think. And apart from the living building challenge, uh, these petals show the 10 principles of One Planet Living mapped against other environmental tools and assessment methodologies which are used in the UK. And as I say, only the living building challenge really addresses this whole breadth. So we try and share the knowledge inside the practice. We have exhibitions um, and uh, uh, and campaign with industry and politics. And during the pandemic, set out a, a materials matter exhibition where each of these pillars contained a unit of material which which it had emitted one cubic meter of carbon dioxide in its production, so that people could pick up pieces of material and just try and understand what the impact is in terms of energy. And out of that, we developed a tool for trying to assess early stage design decision making with embodied carbon, which Joe will describe for the workshop. Thank you. So uh, on to the good stuff. Uh, so hopefully you've all downloaded FCBS Carbon and you've had a little look at these kind of things. If you haven't, it's all on there. I'm going to take you through what's going to be happening in the workshop. We've got kind of two hours. Should be plenty of time. Should be kind of good fun. It is a good opportunity to ask lots of really difficult questions of me, Ian and Sarah, because that's the fun bit. Um, what we really want to get from this, Ian showed a slide that said architects and the built environment are a account for 39% of carbon emissions globally. That means in here there are 70-ish people who have ability to control 39% of the carbon emissions. So what we want you all to be able to do is not be nervous or put off in terms of embodied carbon calculations. We want you to understand and, and have those kind of arguments that push forward retrofits. So the kind of discussion about it's an unloved building, actually all of a sudden you can say, by doing this, we can save X amount of kilograms of CO2, and we save a bit more of the planet. And those are the kind of key agencies we want to get from this. So there's a few bits we're going to talk about, uh, how to reduce the impact of our buildings, identify the value of the materials. Hopefully, we'll come out of a nice model at the end of it as well, so fingers crossed. Uh, don't cut your fingers on any of these kind of things. That's kind of fine. You'll be, you'll be all right. So this is the site. I don't know if you know it, Phoenix Strat. Um, it is... Uh, Kind of nice street. It's much nicer than it used to be. If anybody's been here for a few years, it's recently been refurbished. It used to be some terrible uh, roadway that ran along the top of it. I think it was trains, and they buried the trains in the ground. Something exciting like that. And here it is. The reason we picked this street is not because it's an architectural gem. It's an average street. Actually, one of the interesting things about Delft is you don't have very many average streets. They're all beautiful and cute streets. That's why Delft's it, right? And this has a real mix of different architectural buildings. So. There are the kind of tr traditional uh, kind of brick buildings. You've got a few more newer brick buildings, but you've also got a few which kind of look steel framey and exciting, right? Um, it'd be interesting to see how close you can get the embodied carbon on this. So I reckon you should be able to do most of these tasks in an hour and a half, which gives you plenty of time, right? But as a little primer, so you know what you're looking at, these are life cycle assessment stages. Uh, hands up if you've seen them, out of curiosity, familiar? Yeah, there's a few. Okay, great. I'm going to quickly whistle through these um, just so you get an idea of it. One of the important things about carbon and sustainability is the common language we use to talk about it. It's incredibly difficult to talk about carbon over the life cycle of a building 
if you don't have the kind of same kind of language. So, key things. This one, can you, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Upfront carbon. Bop, bop. This is A1 to A5. This is taking your raw materials, whether it's a forest or a hole in the ground, manufacturing it, turn it into something useful. Maybe it gets turned into something useful again. Um, and then it gets delivered to your site and then it gets turned into the building. So all of that carbon that's emitted for each of those little steps, that's your upfront carbon. That is the bit that we as architects and designers can really manage and control. Those are the easy bits. We can get those figures quite simply and we'll talk about that in a bit. The next bit is a bit in pink. So you can see this pink dotted line here. So this is life cycle embodied carbon. This is A1 to A5, B1 to B5, C1 to C4. So it's got the upfront stuff, it's got the hole in the ground to the building. It's got the in use stage as well. So that's cleaning, maintenance, fixing hinges, lick of paint, whatever else. But it also has included in there replacement cycles. So think about how often things are replaced. Think about the flooring in here, how long this will last. Think about carpets, how long a double glazing unit will last. So all these things can get built into. We can design to have buildings that are, have longevity. And then we start to get into the end of life. So what happens to building the end of life? Do you just take it apart and rebuild it somewhere else or do you smash it down with a big ball and a chain? Again, these are things we can control as designers from the outset. All of them have carbon impacts. There's a few bits I've, I've deliberately overlooked. So at the end, we've got module D, circular economy bits, that's benefits outside our boundary, perfectly fitting. So thinking about how we can influence other people when we, with our buildings. Maybe it's the environment, maybe it's uh, another manufacturer, maybe it's another building straight away. What can we do to support those? Is it materials that go into it? Is it about supporting, you know, providing extra energy out to them? These are all things we can do with our buildings. There's a few in the yellow here. We're not gonna look at operational carbon today. It's too much in two hours. This could be a whole semester worth of lectures and I'm sure you'd all love it. Um, but it would be quite a long two hours, right? So we're gonna ignore operational carbon for a minute. We're just gonna overlook it. We think there's a little more knowledge in the industry at the minute, so it should be a bit easier. So just a little reminder, this is how you can body, calculate embodied carbon. It is super easy. There's a lot of mystery about these kind of things, certainly in the UK. People are nervous and scared. I spend a lot of time talking to house builders. But effectively, it's a simple multiplication. You take the material quantity, its volume or its mass, and you multiply it by the emissions per unit, and you just add them up for each of your materials. It is that simple. Um, we should be able to measure the quantities of material. We might get it from a quantity surveyor or a cost consultant. Uh, we might get it from BIM or Revit. Um, so we can take all those kind of figures together. M emissions per unit, we don't have to calculate them. They come from databases. They are already calculated by manufacturers. They have environmental product declarations. France has an amazing database. They've required that everybody who makes a sustainability claim about their product has an EPD. So there's loads of them out there. If you multiply the two together, job done, nice and easy. Um, the next tricky thing when we think about embodied carbon is we don't necessarily know what good looks like. So this is a table from Letty, which I helped develop, and it gives us kind of A to G, or A plus to G ratings, if you like, on embodied carbon, and it's in two sets. The top half, our upfront embodied carbon, remember that hole in the ground to the building opening? That is where most of the carbon emissions are in a building. So that's that upfront carbon. So a typical building in the UK built currently would be about an E to F, just along that line there. So somewhere around 1100 to 950, so about 1000, right? Uh, when we start to look at life cycle body carbon, it'd be near sort of 1500-ish. So when you're getting your figures out of the tool we do in the workshop, just keep an eye on them, see if they seem about right. If they're coming out lower than 500 or 400, seems a bit low. If they're coming out at 1500 plus, it's way too high. None of those buildings should be that kind of level. So just bear that in mind. Again, we can talk through these kind of bits. So on to the task, what are we gonna ask you, actually ask you to do? So we've got four things to do today. Um, apologies, it is a bit number heavy. So. FCBS carbon to model, model one building. So we're gonna pick one of those buildings on Phoenix Strat. We're gonna split out into 10 groups. I think about 10, we'll see. North nodding, that's excellent. Into 10 groups, you're gonna pick one building each and you're gonna have a quick go at it and I'll talk you through that in a second. 
Second, we've already modeled one of the buildings for you. One as an example to help you model the next one, but also see if you can try and find ways to reduce it. So if we had to rebuild it, how do you do it? I'll look at that again. Third, a bit of a deep dive into, into facades. So one of the things we we're really able to control as architects and designers is facades. And they are not necessarily always obvious where the carbon is. So I'll run a quick half an hour sort of deep dive into them for those who are interested, probably one or two from each group. You come, there's a facade calculator in the, uh, in the Dropbox tool. It's not Dropbox, is it? It's some, some drive, thanks, mystery drive, on the drive. Um, so you can download it, have a go at that, and I'll take you through how to calculate that. It's not gonna be so much used today, but in Thursday, when you start to go into the next bit, it's gonna be really useful to understand how you do that detailing, where the carbon is, and get an idea of it. And then finally, because numbers are boring, we're gonna turn it into something physical. One of the things that's really important about, as an architect and designer, you have an awful lot of ability to uh, convey difficult things very simply. Getting people to understand what things mean is part of your role as you become sort of built environment professionals. So this is one of the things we're gonna try and do today. We're gonna to try and create a physical model of it, which represents the embodied carbon of Phoenix Strap, which should be pretty good fun. Hopefully we get a nice little townscape from it. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. I can't stress that enough. Uh, we'll show you our model, and then you'll probably have a good idea of what it looks like. Feel free to do nice ones, obviously. So these are the buildings. Um, so you can see they're all grouped along. I'll leave this on the screen when we're finished. We've modeled building zero. Nice little number on the corner. Um, hasn't always been so nice. It's always worth going on to Google Street View, look at the histories, each of those buildings. So one per group. And what we really want to think about is how we're gonna use FCBS Carbon in this to kind of capture it. So FCBS Carbon was designed for us internally as a practice to get the idea of embodied carbon into the practice. It was new for us, for most of the architects. What we really struggle with is estimating embodied carbon right at the start of a project. It's really difficult to do. So we created FCBS Carbon to estimate the bill of quantities in a building. Once you've got a bill of quantities, again, a simple multiplication we can turn it into embodied carbon. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. Looking at a building that's already there, turning it into embodied carbon quite quickly. So it's standard construction buildups, it's a library, uh, and it's algorithmically described building. All sounds very exciting, I'm sure, but it's quite simple. Once you get stuck into it, you'll get through this in no time. There's three input pages. We are only gonna do two of the input pages today. We're gonna to do zero and two, I'll show you those. There's two output pages, the detailed and overview, and I'll quickly show you what's in those. But for reference, inputs are yellow, outputs are bluey gray. Um, it's, in theory, colorblind friendly. If any of you are colorblind and it's not friendly, I would love to know, always making sure these things are inclusive. So this is the first bit, the first page of FCBS Carbon. There's two, um, or there's two tabs. Complete the ones with the red star on it. If you don't complete them, it will break. It will seem like a mystery. So make sure they're done. They are super easy. Where it says estimated year of completion, just put in today, like this year. Don't worry about going into the past. It's just not worth it. If you put in 2023, you'll get the same answers. And this is the main bit where you'll spend probably half an hour of your time. It is, looks like there's lots going on here, but it's pretty straightforward. There's this bit. This is the key section. These are the descriptors of the building layout. The seven of them there. You've got building perimeter, you've got uh, footprint, width, floor to floor height, glazing ratio, number of stories above ground, number of stories below ground. So we'll be able to work those out. If you're not sure if it's got a basement or not, just put it at zero. We can't, we're not like, we're not magic. We don't know if it's got a basement. Uh, probably we'll be looking at this on Google Maps. So go through those. These, so there's another sheet. So if you want to split this task up into two of you, spread it out. There's a sheet which just tells you what all these kind of variables are. So somebody can maybe look at the variables and sort of measure things off the drawings. I think I sent through the CAD file so you can get an idea of some of those and I'll show you how to calculate them as well. Um, there are tips and tricks in the tool. So once you click on a box, it should tell you. Um, the second person can look at materials, which is the second bit. So when you all through that, you've got an idea of what the variables are. This is where you start to go through and pick materiality. There are a common suite of materials all the way through this. You will not need all of the kind of building elements. Some of your buildings may or may not have pile foundations. It probably won't have a raft and a pile foundation. It'll have one or the other. 
It might not have columns and beams, it might just have load-bearing partition walls that's made out of brick. So just go through. The trick with this is to go through it once quickly, get all the materials you think are in there, get them in, have a little think about it, come back to it again, see if it seems about right. Don't dwell on it for too long. The longer you get stuck on saying, oh, well, I think it's a double skin brick, but I don't have that. There are ways around it, and we can show you how to fix those things as well. This is the output tab. Um, in the one that we've sent to you, this bit here in the top left is grayed out because we're not using it. You can move it if you want to have a look. You can fill it in if you really want to have a go at it. Um, but we're just going to be mostly focusing on this bit. This is the breakdown of where the carbon is. So we'll understand um, where the kind of peaks and troughs, what's using it all up. So in this building, this example, it's all about the building services. Not that surprising, building services get replaced every 20 years. It's quite a lot of churn. Um, so it can be quite high, much higher than some of the other bits. And this is life cycle carbon. The other thing to note, Ian showed you the um, RIVA targets along the top. Just to tell you roughly where you sit against the RIVA 2030 targets. So it'll give you an idea of whether you're good or bad. These are all going to be pretty average buildings. So if you're seeing yourself at extremes, you'll know it's going to be kind of weird. And there's another bit in the output here. So if you're interested, this little table here, this will help you give all the figures you'll need when you do all the building modeling, physical modeling. So that's the first task. Second one, we've modeled the building for you. We'll use it as an example. We'll have a little look at it. Um, it's that one on the corner. It's fine. I mean, it's not an architectural gem. There it is. What a view. It's got UPVC windows and this horrible blocked up one. It's been there for years. Um, what we want you to do is have a look at it and see how low you can get the embodied carbon of that building if you were to remake it now. So think about the materiality, have a go at it. It could be its reclaimed materials, it could be its bio-based materials. Have a little look at it, see what you can do. We're interested to see your kind of design skills. FCBS Carbon is a tool that's really good at estimating embodied carbon, but it's a, it's a design tool. It's not a passive thing. It's about working your way through it. So the third task, uh, deep dive into carbon of a facade. So I'm going to spend half an hour, uh, a couple of people from each group perhaps, we'll have a go through it, we'll talk a bit about detailing how you make a, a facade for instance, some of those key bits and I'll show you how to use the tool and you can get an idea of it. Would it be interesting to think about how you can make a low carbon facade and what, what sits in it? There's a couple of key ways to do it, we'll talk about those in a bit of detail. Um, and there you go, here's the, here's the kind of tool, and you can see it's obviously got a graph on, because all I do is present graphs and numbers seemingly nowadays. Um, but have a little look, okay? So have a think once you get into your groups, see who wants to do what, split out if a couple of you want to come and talk to me about that, perfect. Finally, and the fun bit, we want you to start to represent this. This is our building, uh, it's beautiful, it's made by Sam in our office real corker. Um, oh yeah, there you go, a physical prop, here you go. Ooh, that's a correct response. Um, isn't it lovely? Um, so Sam knocked this up on Friday. It took him, I don't know, 20 minutes, tops. Bear in mind from, that includes us briefing him and telling him how it works. So we'd like you to make a model of your building. It can look as sexy and as nice as this. It can look sexier and nicer if you'd like it to do that. That is also fine. Um, and then, so this is at 1 to 100. There are materials around the corner of the stage. Loads of bits and pieces. There's loads of cards, there's knives, there's glue, there's tape. Um, once you've made the model, what we want you to do is make a plinth for it. So we have a physical representation. The life cycle of embodied carbon emissions giving it a height. So we have another bit, I think, somewhere dotted around. Hang on, a glamorous assistant. Thank you. So this is a representation of how much carbon that building emits. So we've gone for a scale of one millimeter equals five kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. And you can see all of a sudden, when we have a whole townscape, what we should have is a, a kind of arc of what's going on across that building. Some of those buildings, I reckon, in the middle in particular should be pretty high carbon. So have a little look. So that's the idea. So you'll need to do the SCBS carbon thing first, then you can plug it all into there. 
How does that sound? Lots of thoughts, lots of questions. Ready for effectively an hour of something of spreadsheeting. It's what you all got into architecture for. Yeah, spreadsheets. But so if you split up into your groups, make sure you've got copies of FCBS Carbon. Um, they should all be on the drive. Have a little download of them. Um, we'll be around. We've got nice little. So this, they're all going to sit on top of this. Yes, hard base. It's one in 100 the scale, so you can measure this, or you can measure the computer version you have on your laptop. Um, we thought we'll stick this somewhere here, probably on the floor, and then while you make your building, you can build the whole bit scale of it. Cool. And it should show you, in theory, that that orange case varies in sizes, depending on what the carbon intake of that building Cool, so hopefully we'll have a nice little output. Excellent. Thoughts, questions? Excellent.